The main uh, thing that they were trying to point out that it's very similar to toll free data. Mm. So toll free calls, uh, they were saying the way toll free numbers are there right now, similarly toll free data should also be there. Mm. So but uh, the EIB guys they reputed it by saying that toll free data calls me to kya hota hai ki, that's not the only entry point for a business. Right. Because calling is just a facilitator, right? It's right. not the only entry point. But for a uh, toll free data, if you create, you know, at a zero something like that. For apps, the only entry point is data. Mm. So that was something I found very interesting and a little thought provoking basically. Yeah. So you know what happens is that anything uh, for if, if you really want a transformation Sorry. on this it has to be it cannot be restricted to a few people who really understand it. It has to be something that you know goes into the public psyche. Right. And people understand and people say that look we don't we, we want things this way. Right. right? So you have the caste system mm -hmm. about which we are writing and talking about it and doing number of things, right? Making laws, but it's there. Right. Okay, it's there. You can't do anything. It's in public psyche. It's in the minds of the people. You can't make a law which enters people's mind and cleans it out. Okay. Right. The other, the only way to deal with that is to create other ideas which spread and actually reaches people and takes over, like you know, creates a space there. You need people's mind space. And that is when you know this AIB and anyone else actually making a making you know videos about it, which people understand, right. and they understand in their own way. It's not like they'll understand the way Vivek or Kanan or Anjani understand. It will right. be something that I, it's doesn't. They don't have to get the law, but it's people feeling that you know I want my internet free. I want my rights. I want my. This is how it will be. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. don't you think that net neutrality when they are talking about the problem is not about understanding, it's more about how much you know it will contravene the laws itself because you've got so many laws which can actually act against such. So one being the competition law, mm -hmm. and you know cartels being formed and restricting what data it's got a you know very uh, pertinent point which comes there is that you are forcing out competitions and trying to avoid or you know trying to create you know avoid creating new competitors for yourself mm -hmm. thereby you know the existing players themselves are creating the monopoly so you know instead of you know all of us raising our voices and uh, making a hue and cry wouldn't it be better in in a way to challenge this in the courts of law even though if it takes a time they cannot make a decision till the decision is handed down yeah so wouldn't that be a much better option to pursue rather than educating the public and they do what they want to do, that's the way that things have been happening in India. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, it's better, if I feel that, you know, a better option for going is basically under the various laws again, most of the, uh, you know, discriminative practice, we can also invoke some of the constitutional law articles, you know, absolutely. where you have the equality to trade, you know, and in a way, you know, constitutional law, you've got competition law, and Moreover, then you know, how do you differentiate? Are you telling the users when they you collect their data, we will be using this to differentiate what type of you know mm. net speeds you should get depending on the data? Okay, my thought on this is that there has to be consensus building. Right? Yeah, and the public pressure really will help in uh, you know not allowing the government to again come out with something which is very similar. There, the public pressure will really help right? yeah. instead of a litigation, you know, you know thing. You, even I think in, even in 66A, one thing which was really beneficial was that public pressure to a large degree was aligned with the constitutional arguments which were done yeah. at a later point of time. Mm -hmm. So what you noticed was that whenever the case was coming for hearing, there used to be regular updates on it. 
uh, each arrest used to be highlighted in the media. This was also because the NCRB, the National Crime Records Bureau, was not putting out statistics on 66A arrests. It was not being reported. So, you know, the media narrative flowed with the judgment itself. Firstly, if you look at the first petition filed by Shreya Singhal, she latches on to the arrest of Shaheen Danda and Renu Srinivasan. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's painted such a convenient uh, narrative also. This goes back to a point I made earlier. When you look at even a challenge to the sodomy laws in the United States in Lawrence versus Texas, there's a beautiful New Yorker article on it, which is called the search for the perfect petitioner. So a human narrative is inherent in my belief to some degree in a legal challenge. Also our courts are conscious of it, they do not expressly state it. But uh, when the uh, when itself the, the constitutionality of the death penalty was impugned in, um, uh, in the case of Indira Gandhi's attackers, the court has stated this is not a fit, fit case on facts itself to um, examine the constitutionality of the death penalty. Human narratives are important. Uh, secondly, what we are also discussing with respect to constitutional challenges, how do, do they, um, uh, they, they form a part or uh, they should be disjointed from legislative processes. I believe legislative processes are much more predictable and they are much more amenable to public dialogue. Uh, court processes uh, approach uh, issues even if we uh, say that public pressure is to a large degree towards striking down the legality, not on the basis of public policy, morality and desirability of a law. Second, but in certain instances, for instance, in the case of uh, the chal uh, challenge by NAS Foundation against Section 377 to get it read down and to protect the rights and choices of people who have sexual identities which are not, mono uh, which are not, uh, head up, which are not, uh, you know, man, man, uh, so, man, woman, in a sense, you know, the heteronormative, heteronormative, the heteronormative choices, in that sense, you know, in that instance, I believe that you have to go to court, because yeah. the thing is, it is an issue of minority rights by itself. It is, it is you do not even need to engage in a wider, of course, it is beneficial, but you're talking about tyranny of majority situation. Yes, yeah, so it's, a, it's okay. you know, this is what, it's it's essentially an issue of minority rights in that instance. Yeah. It's just that it's not expressly stated in the constitution that sexual identity as well is a basis for a minority right to be carved out. But I believe, you know, when we are agitating your minority rights in a sense, uh, yes, it's beneficial for the larger public to be involved in that entire discourse. However, at the same point of time, it should not influence the court process because minority rights cannot ever be protected by majoritarian discourse. So now I would I would rather request James to actually simplify the entire concept and can you just tell us what it is all about? No, no, the entire no, no, no. Just simplify it. Yeah, what the neutrality is that they are trying to say is that packets you know, every data is sent through packets, receiver and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sender. Now what is happening in neutrality is that if supposing I'm downloading a media file, mm -hmm. I will have a lower speed than somebody like, you know, Netflix who is in agreement with, let's say, Google mm -hmm. or some other, you know, big yeah, organization. Yeah. They'll say that, you know, we will send you this packet at a higher speed but these particular packets, since it's not in that particular box or category, will not be at the same speed. So you will have videos which may be downloaded at 512 kbps in India. Right. You know, in abroad it may be 1 mbps speed. But in India it may be 512 because 512 is supposed to be very good in our country. Yeah. So, you know, so at that speed, and you may get that same from the Netflix uh, channel. You may get the same video being downloaded at you know, 2 mbps, 3 mbps. So what they are doing is, Effectively, they are making sure that new, no new competition comes in. Right. They monopolize, and then you know, uh, basically uh, make the profit out. Of these are what they call the OTTs, over-the-top services. Right. Yeah. But this is not exactly the problem that is happening there. That's the base. Right? That's Atel, the base. Atel is not going to throttle the internet. No. Atel is categorically saying that we will not throttle. Trust. We are just saying a particular uh, few websites will be available without any, you know data cost attached to it. Now can you so one is speed neutrality, the yeah. other is cost neutrality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In both the sales, you know, starting kill it, everybody will say that. Ah, wo right. wali baat hai. Ek bar, you know, once you have set the thing yeah. in place, yeah. then yeah. it will, you know, go ahead. You know, the you trajectory know, is dangerous. The trajectory is very dangerous. Yeah. To right. stop it there itself is the most important thing. You know, not let it go before the legislation. If the legislation, you know, you want the legislation to hear you. 
all these, you know, even from a, a, a subsequent point of view, if the law is, you know, done and you know, legislated and put in force, everything, the minute you have, you have a basis to even challenge that law, even at the minute it is in force, showing that here, you know, there was a public consensus. They acted against the public consensus. You know, they just this was just hogwash for the corporates. This is basically for creating a, a, a cartel monopoly. Anil you know, had something very interesting to say when we were having some distilled water somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> something with regards to telecom. Only they come across. Sure. So, the other side of the story, right? Yeah. Other side of the story. That's important. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I mean, see, uh, uh, this this debate has become more of a you know kind of net neutrality. Uh, against uh, uh, you know the telcos, but uh, maybe so. So my, my position here is net neutrality is sacrosanct, and there's no taking away from that. Uh, but there is uh, uh, the 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 story of the, the telcos is probably not getting as much attention, uh, and, and and there is there, there is some which of course is kind of uh, uh, you know there's, there's some merit to to their arguments as well. And probably what is required is to to balance out the two competing interests. Now the proposals on the table right now seem to be that you know one kind of uh, comes at the cost of the other, which may not necessarily be true. And you know there's there's a potential to balance out these two interests. Uh, and the interest on the telco side, I mean, is you know basically like you you got to make sure that the infrastructure provider is incentivized enough. Um, so just to come in here, firstly, you know we as humans have a natural instinct towards uh, looking at two opposing positions and paint them in an extreme and then go for a consensus. <laughs> However, you know, that approach to argument by itself, though natural, is not suited to all circumstances, especially this one. My reason for saying this is that telecom operators make more money already right now on the basis of the amount of data which travels over their network. Price of data is not regulated by TRAI. They have raised it two times over the last year itself. All methods of financial calculation show they are making enough money. It's the average uh, revenue per minute of user, return on investment on the third metric. We have actually got Deepak Shinoy from Capital Mind to analyze it. Their own investor reports after every quarter state that they are making tremendous amount of money, revenues, also on the metrics. They say it on earning calls that data does not cannibalize our traditional revenues. Now let's come to the issue of spectrum costs for infrastructure upgradation. For that they avail term loan facilities. Even after the la latest round of spectrum auctions, Crystal, which is a debt rating agency says that the growth stories is intact. This is co concurred by Morgan Stanley and other debt rating agencies. They essentially are going after regulatory capture. Through law, they want enforcement of, um, of uh, revenue sharing agreements and turn this into an MBAS platform, yeah. which we have already seen. Yeah. In MBAS, what did the telco say? Yeah. They stated that we don't require any regulation. Yeah. Let us enter into commercial arrangements one on one with the MBAS player because a MBAS service was offered on a web portal of IDEA or Airtel. And what did they do with the MBS market? Firstly, they killed them. Secondly, they engaged in massive consumer fraud and overbuilders. All of us have at least one relative who has been overcharged for one call or tune on their phone, which they never placed. Yeah. They are already making enough money. Right. Yes. At, yeah, yes, yes. Fair enough. I mean, they are making enough money. But in the free market, it is nobody's job to tell me how much money I should be making. I'm making good money. I want to make more. And that is kind of part of the business model, right? Uh, so, so I mean, that, that's that's really but what is, but but, but, uh, see, is, but we are a public utility. No, 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 public just take it from yeah. the bigger, larger telecoms. You know, uh, 26 February, the FCC in the US they voted for the net neutrality again, the entire uh, entire protection of internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the statement which came out was that because we want more Googles and Facebooks to come out from. Uh, so we have to. Distinguished gentlemen sitting right here, Ramanu, Jan, Vivek. In fact, they, they represent the startup. Uh, zone and in fact, so I would want your views one after the other. That how do you think would affect you, whatever we're discussing, right? I'll I you know what much. I really like what you said that you know, you, how much money I could make should not be restricted, but it's not just about that, you know, it's also about what kind of country I want to live in, what kind of society I want to live in, okay, what kind of work I would like to do, and how if do I have the opportunity to do it. Of course, telcos should make as much money they can, and I hope they come up with innovations. And they really kill it 
in the market and they do really well but not on rent seeking you know rent seeking is different what you are talking about is that you know we want this country to be a hub of innovation we want them to come up with services products that will be all be bowled over by and we'll all pay for it not by creating a monopoly which is going to you know make it difficult and, and that for is exactly people to say that uh, like you brought it as a concept i mean at least me personally i'm not saying that you know, you said that yes that was right absolutely i'm saying that let us also look at what the telcos have to say there absolutely. probably is a genuine concern absolutely. which is what i just kind of voice out and you need to balance it out i'm not saying it comes at the cost of net neutrality see i don't follow uh, the neutral litigation very much but i faintly remember this case in france where i believe up maybe upper you can throw more light on it i'm sure you know about it so there was a situation where the telcos started demanding money from google and uh, yeah. because they have a huge traffic like you know 60% 70% of the traffic is basically google mm -hmm. and they said that boss we can't uh, you know it's essentially you finance you subsidizing you so yeah. you have to pay so maybe upper you can tell you yeah, firstly just suspect every argument that telco throws to you go back to the data 40% of the data at least in india is gaming right uh rest is torrent traffic a uh, web streaming etc it's not google uh, associated services of facebook yes they are high data services by themselves but they are not constituting the bulk okay. secondly it also presumes that service providers which are online do not put any money in terms of cost server cost or get into relationships with cdns which are uh, essentially mm -hmm. mirroring ag agreement yeah. mirroring yeah. agreements in a sense right there's enough investment by them as well and what's the core function of a telecom company to serve the bandwidth right yeah. it's already making money on it right yeah and uh, then it says it wants to roll out a zero rated service for increased access where does the spectrum scarcity go there yeah right yeah. so something is not making sense right what is the argument and what do they want no i would like to know if you know like you know historically if you look at the telco companies and what they have done in india has been quite surprising they have also entered a core banking function which is through the m wallet system they are, they are distorting marketplace after marketplace entering systems because they realize that the smartphone right now is the key to a lot of businesses and you know you need to prevent them from creating entry barriers for other competing products which may offer greater value as well as better innovation and that what is happening right now you know through creation of let's say a zero rated platform which has dominated discourse on network neutrality by itself what do we notice in a zero rated platform for instance uh, does facebook's internet.org has any google service yeah why does it have baba jobs and not nokri yeah and can baba jobs and nokri both be there yeah okay secondly if you look at it as zeros a um, uh, zero rated platform it is Uh, is stated as a marketing platform for online company and we are going to charge the same flat rate to everyone the rate is not even diverged till now till date will they raise it every year yeah. that's also not diverged please examine arguments which are made by telecom companies with a high degree of scrutiny okay. they, we really need to know their intentions yeah. you know no, what because, exactly is. because the starting point is we are in losses and their quarterly reports are showing that exactly. net profit so but if i may yeah. ask you a question apart on this yes. the kind of symptoms that you are talking about is it because we have just the same flat rate for every user do you think that if there was like this um, net neutrality was scrapped out and if they could charge any kind of amount to use a certain products or certain websites do you think that these practices would stop automatically because then they would have no reason to kind of go through so differential pricing as yes. per user is still permissible and they do it they have differential pricings for business users and for home users they have differential pricings for different amounts of data packs and blending it but differentiating as per the sure. kind of service i then choose through that pack that is what i am stating should not be permitted by law but they are saying you no know, as alil was saying that this is really hampering their own innovation or investing in the kind of bandwidth that they want to provide so for if net neutrality continues for the next 10 years perhaps you would have the same kind of speed and the same kind of service no if you look at if you look at broadband deployment in india by itself that's a much more complex issue and raya has come out with recommendations on the broadband policy recently what does it state it firstly most foreign jurisdictions are uh, are availing broadband through wire access mm. here the wire access itself is so bad and is so poor that the um, uh, the internet adoption is primarily occurring over the mobile band mm. 
that's one secondly in terms of the mobile band by itself even at this point of time the networks and the towers are the infrastructure is yeah. fairly yeah. It's, it's fairly bad yeah we are all paying for 3g and getting 2g yes right Absolutely, and that's why we want new startups to come in. And Anirudh, Anirudh used the word, you know, free market economy. Uh, the Airtel Zero plan is exactly doing, uh, contradicting that. It's not allowing the free market economy to run. I mean, it, it will uh, eventually it will create a situation where you know, uh, innovation will uh, ultimately stop, and only big corporates, big. You take take the example of DTH cable. What happened in cable? Only Videocon, Tata, uh, Ambani's. They are the players who are. In a position to enter into this uh, this uh, industry, we don't want internet to become like that, right? We want, uh, you know, Ola is a big big player now, but when it started, it was a small player. Mm -hmm. So we don't want a situation like that in internet also to happen. So the free market economy, uh, you know, um, is something which is being stopped by this whole, you know, uh, thing that is happening. It may be basically, the fear is the fear is that you know the whole startup, you know. Uh, Phenomena, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is which is there in the country. Mm -hmm. The fear is that you know it will, uh, you know, create hurdles uh, in that that phenomena. Right. The, the whole thing. It will kill it. I mean, kill kill the whole startup revolution. Exactly. Exactly. Vivek somehow has uh, kind of lost the theme somewhere I feel, and distorting issues. So one, I think the the debate should be net neutrality or no net neutrality. It is not really a telco versus. I mean, it's an incident which has kind of provoked it to be a telco versus OTT debate. But if you look at it. Any large OTT, which you know, of course, uh, the the biggest argument is that this will throttle new innovation, new startups from uh, coming in. But look at the bigger OTTs; uh, they are actually the biggest kind of violators of the rule of net neutrality. It is not just telcos. If you look at Google Search, a classic example, you can actually pay or strategize to get yourself uh, listed up. When I mean, going by the same principle, I should have as much of an access to you know, kind of uh, as, a, as a new uh, new service as anybody else. So I, I think the debate should really not be telco versus anybody else. It's, it's, it's really I don't know if Google is the right example so because they categorically the state that the sponsored link is not organic result. Mm -hmm. They say that you know uh, this uh, this is an advertisement and they are not misleading the, uh, not the public. The Perfect. Topic. So I think yes. Uh, apart from net neutrality, uh, another very important thing which came out in the light in the recent past, I would say, was the starting of 66A, the historic decision which came out. In fact. The two rock star judges, one of them being Rohinton Nariman. So, so I would rather want again James to just give us a small insight into it uh, in a very simplified manner. What what was 68 68A and what happened? Look, 66A when it just came out, it had to do with offensive messages. Now, offensive messages was not. Good. You know, now when you say that. Uh, I mean, uh, for the biggest uh, starting of all this and it became public was that famous Shanine case on Facebook where she just said that, you know, I do not understand why is it so important for, to celebrate a dead person's, you know, whatever, uh, uh, Thakre and all that. And she got arrested under 66A. Now the first thing is that 66A as a weapon, and we ourselves sometimes are involved in litigation concerning 66A. Now what happens there is that there is no set criteria for messages to become offensive, one. Second, what I find offensive may be completely normal for another person. Third, they are uh, uh, bringing every single person under the ambit of section 66 and that is not only A, A to F. Complaint, A to F, let's file it under IT law, the case will go on for four years, five years. That's being used as a weapon for, you know, uh, building up this uh, you fear. Know, fear in people. You don't follow me, you don't uh, uh, agree to with me. I go file a 66A complaint, cyber cell comes in who have you know, next to no knowledge of how the particular section should be implemented. Secondly, now when the greatest problem when the 66A judgment has been struck down is that, you know, if I may draw parallels from the American laws, American laws are much more precise, specific, you know, most of them even have numerical, you know, uh, parameters. Now, if we could have actually said these type of offensive messages may fall under that, 
or if the court instead of you know clearly uh, going by a knee jerk reaction or oh, everybody is uh, you know protesting 66a let's knock it down that was not the answer the 66a judgment should have been more so you know uh, like what you say parameterizing the specifics but what in that the job of the executive chain do you really want the courts rule of law even after the legislature has made a law they have still the court has the right to interpret so uh, one argument against that would be in terms of criminal statutes when their constitutionality is challenged if a court interprets a phrase it creates offense by itself in fact this has been stated in kartar singh so you know that's why even the reading down has to be very specific and with 66a that was a challenge also no 66a it was not a challenge you know the first thing is many of the laws that we have studied and we have fought in courts for you would say that the interpretation would have been wide you know it can swing either way now the fact is not because it's too wide it, you know you if a law cannot because if you see the early laws the ipc was made in 1860s there are many situations which are coming and which could not you know actually help uh, managing that situation that's where information technology of pencil 66a card came into play now you it's just been let's say 90s was the advent of the internet it's just been how many 25 years and suddenly we have a situation where we are saying okay this law has not worked out let's strike it down instead of you know laying down certain steps so that it can become a smoother process and that this you cannot so, you know uh, but uh, you know if you go through the opinion of the court it talks in three paragraphs about the cbr ability <coughs> so the doctrine of cbr ability essentially holds for the benefit of people who are not lawyers is that if there are parts which can be uh, separated as constitutional and unconstitutional a court is obligated to uh, conduct that exercise and only strike down the provision which offends the constitutional okay. guarantee okay. and there the court says that the phrases by itself because they lack definition they are not being tied in with the general clauses act they have been tied tied in with the indian penal code that is why they are prone to misuse and because of that we need to strike it down okay. now coming i'm saying taking your own you know argument i'm saying 66a if you say that this is unconstitutional part that's why i must strike it down it's not the correct way because you know there will be many laws unless and until you can put but you know you have to remember there is a legislator you know the people sitting there they are not all the voice they do not know all our thoughts right so just they, just to extend it further the 66a thing so now 66a was all about encroaching the freedom of speech, speech and, and expression, expression right yes but still we have 69 right what about that so government has power that they can block any website any content which is there you know at any time which has happened in nagaland No, that which is I'll give you I'll give you a practical yeah. example with yeah. what happened with us. Uh, so, uh, sir, few weeks back, DOD suddenly blocked around 32 websites. If you guys know, yes, uh, right. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, one of the website which was blocked in that was Vimeo. Yes. And we were using Vimeo for our e-learning initiative, and hundreds and hundreds of students were using our service to, you know, take proper education that was happening. A paid user, and suddenly we land up in a situation one fine morning that you know our service is not working. Yeah. And why is that? 48 hours. 48 hours, and we were we were getting non-stop calls on our phone number saying that why our service not, they will not understand that you know why the government has blocked what so the randomness that is there the big brother approach that the government has this needs to be stopped. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you know, 69 has a very specific parameters where the government can come in and interfere. You know, it has set uh, clauses. Now, what 66A? What has happened is the minute we have struck it down. we have left everybody and anybody to go ahead and speak whatever they want to say on the net 66a yeah you know because uh, how would you uh, differentiate just because you wanted to stop you know the misuse you came up with an idea is just throw away the thing that is 69 years justified 69 in certain cases may be justifiable you cannot have a clear इंटरमीडियट चैलेंज 
not 69A, which is the power of the blocking to the central government, but in the manner it is exercised, which were the blocking rules. Firstly, with regard to 66A, we asked for a complete quashing of the section itself. According to us, the arbitrariness and the vice was not in the application of the provision, but in the provision itself. It was vague and it was prone to arbitrary application. In criminal statutes, criminal statutes owe an obligation of reasonable precision. So there are guidelines for the state police to enforce them and to apply them in specific criteria. In, you know, and that the opinion of the court also acknowledges. In paragraph 6, it states that there is a difference between speech, advocacy and incitement. And even when speech reaches the point of advocacy, it does not become incitement. And what is 66A doing? It's criminalizing uh, uh, advocacy as well as mere speech by itself. Yeah. Because the phrases and the ingredients of the offense are not present. Secondly, with respect to intermediaries rules, in intermediaries rules we were stating that there's a private censorship process which is being followed where any person complains privately to an intermediary and they are incentivized to take it down. Why? Because the intermediary liability system by itself presumes that a platform such as Google or Facebook, which are intermediaries, do not create the content by themselves. Hence, do not commit the illegality by themselves. If the content is a defamatory article, the ultimate liability should be visited on the user. However, how do we get the content taken down? That was the point of contention. Should it be pursuant to a private complaint or a legal notice sent by a lawyer or should it require an order uh, through a court which then scrutinizes the legal ingredients in it. Yeah. We placed empirical data before the court and how the provision itself is amounting to a private form of censorship because the right of not only the content creator whose the author is at play but also the readers. The readers also have a 191A right. The court agreed with it to a large degree and stated that a takedown notice and the obligation on an intermediary to take down any content only commences once a court or an executive body passes an order. Third, on the blocking rules by itself, the court disagreed with our positions and our submissions and stated that people have a remedy to approach courts under the writ jurisdiction and challenge the blocking orders by themselves. However, in form of a criticism, which is further contained in an article that I wrote for Indian Express, Rule 14 of the blocking rules by itself states that any complaints and actions taken thereof are confidential. That is why each and every blocking order which appears in on Twitter or on any newspaper uh, reportage has this curious two words written on the left hand on the right hand top side, top secret. So, you know, when you contrast that against the order for banning of a book which contains reasons it gives a process by itself where a person, me as an author or me as a citizen can approach a court. When Vimeo was blocked, there was no public order which was put up. It was only after two days of constant outrage, newspaper reports, it was revealed that the Bombay ATS approached a local court and it passed an order to block the websites, which was then sent to the DIT. It was a completely internal pub, uh, that government makes it process. Possible. Yes. Right. So what we were asking for is that the order should be published or at least when somebody accesses a website, a clear notice should be given that pursuant to this order, this website has been blocked. Further, a copy of the order should also be made publicly available and then that will give a remedy to each person to approach a court and to challenge its basis. Uh, one concern which arises here and arises immediately, wouldn't the order which discloses the website by itself uh, uh, lead to uh, the circumvention of the order? Because people will then mirror that content or post it at some place else. Well, that happens also in the cases of book banning and the court has disagreed with it. The court has stated that adequate transparency and disclosure needs to be given in cases of any restriction of the 191A right and these reasons need to be stated. These reasons have not been stated in even one blocking order, which only consists a list of parent URLs most of the time. Yeah, right. So, you know, there is no transparency in the process. Absolutely. So, when you talk about blocking orders and everything, so now we have actually drifted away from 66A and we are moving yeah. to uh, the other aspect of it. Uh, I'm going to Kanan now on this. So, so now, so largely we moved on to something which is uh, internet surveillance. That's what we're talking right. about. If you take a country like India, there are primarily five 
statutes, I would say, which would rather cover the internet surveillance. It would mm -hmm. be the Telegraph Act, the Post Act. Then you have uh, certain sections, 92 of CRPC, CRPC, right? You have, of course, the Information Technology Act after that. Even in Information Technology Act, largely, you have a couple of sections. There's section 44. Uh, then there's section 69, which is about decryption of data. You have section 66A, which is now have been stripped off. And you also have something called a section 80, which which gives the superintendent of police to arrest you without any reason, without any warrant, in fact, not not the reason, at any 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 public place. Uh, so so without going not not going into the technicalities right now. Uh, from the social media's perspective, from the social media's perspective, first you mentioned Ramanuj, uh, the entire idea, the entire concept of internet surveillance, uh, whether of course it is it is a breach of privacy, it's a breach of uh, confidentiality, and uh, so how do you see it? Your opinion from the social uh, perspective. You know, um, when uh, Vasu invited me for this debate, I was kind of reading up all the subjects that uh, you know, 66 and then 69 and uh, net neutrality. I was reading about the concept of internet itself. Now what is internet and why do we have it? Ultimately it is something which we require to kind of share data with other people, understand. So basically the kind of data and kind of communication that we have with each other, that is kind of a platform that internet provides us. Um, in terms of our communication and in, in terms of um, the freedom of expression that the constitution gives us, it becomes very interesting when um, the government tries to control any or um, you know most of the uh, communication that we have within privately or um, to everybody on the internet. So I think it's it's interesting because it's problematic at many levels where um, the whole privacy angle gets violated, and at the same time, um, you would always live under that kind of a fear that you are being surveyed. So the big brother is watching you, and whether the freedom of expression that you apparently uh, enjoy under the constitution exists on the internet or not. So, I mean, it becomes uh, very, very problematic. But at the same time, I understand that when section 66A kind of gets knocked down, um, as a user, I might also think from the other perspective. I mean, what if I am being uh, threatened online or if offensive information is put against me? Do I have one less recourse or do I have one less um, way in which I can kind of approach the courts. I, I think, see, surveillance has existed for, you know, since time of Absolutely. We've had, even in the pre-internet stage, um, uh, boy, if you wrote personal letters which you wanted to be personal or, you know, spoke to somebody on the long line, uh, the government still had powers to, you know, kind of get, have access to that uh, that correspondence, right? Now, in, the in, in this internet world, where, of course, you know, things have kind of, because it has made communication so easy, there is also the you know, the opportunity to uh, to criminals, to terrorists, to whoever else, to do whatever they want to do at a much faster pace and with an anonymity which was not guaranteed before. So, if you look at you know, so surveillance also, I mean, kind of, I think that that's the aim and objective uh, of you know the surveillance laws. Really, the problem is that uh, you know until now, because the jurisprudence around surveillance is still only developing in India and globally, we still don't have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, proper procedures in place, place which should be. So, for example, in India, uh, you know, today, uh, in fact, even in the US, you don't really need a judicial order to, you know, kind of uh, uh, tap into or intercept communication. That, that's for one. The second is the biggest issue that I have with this, uh, with what, uh, with the current framework is that you know, if, if I have to draw an analogy, it is one thing to really put a fishing rod in the pond yes. and put out one fish at a time, throw it back if, you, if that's not the fish you want to eat today. Or, you know, laying out an entire big net, catch everything what yes. you're coming. So, so when you have a typical retention or, you know, or interception order, or, or the government is asking for certain information, they will never say, tell me what communication you had with XYZ on the 23rd of March. They will say, you know, Give me access to your and and that's, that's one of the problems. There's a law which stops surveillance also. They have to have special permission to do that. But permission from home, home minister. So, uh, written, uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, the secretary uh, home ministry has to sign off on that. However, the secretary <coughs> home ministry signed off on one lakh interception orders last year, which means he's signing around four thousand every day. Absolutely. So no, now, but the, there it comes that those orders can be challenged. You know, in the at the end of the day, because it's the basis on which surveillance was, you know, because if like you know, let's say that we appear as opposite counsel, you appearing for the government. Yes. 
I appear in for my client, the yes. first thing I will be uh, you know, asking is for you to produce the document. So, but uh, the thing is, the problem in all of this is that the compliance is not really necessary to make that evidence adducible in law. So, uh, irrespective of the evidence's uh, legality in gathering, uh, it will always be admissible. No, no, I'm not saying the evidence admissibility. I'm basically going to challenge the very basis on which that surveillance, as I said. So, if you look at the precedent which is already before, uh, you know, these uh, surveillance orders are filed in sealed covers with the High Court judges often, and even when they are found to be illegal etc there is no corresponding uh, uh, action which occurs through it because the uh, entire issue which revolves around here is what application of mind was caused when the uh, interception order was uh, was issued and most of these interception orders the ones which are noted in reported decisions at least all they list is that this person this number suspected of some xyz activity and that's enough so the adequacy of it is not designed as per rule 419a i agree but again as you would have you know said uh, you know that you know many a times you may have to suspect somebody you know the, the surveillance according to me the problem where is that people themselves are not aware of their rights that's the basic area you know lawyers you know people uh, social media activists and all the others right. are very well versed with what happens and what we can do now the question here is that as you came and uh, the ma'am also said that once you know if there is a complaint or a remedy has been lost you know 66a somebody posting something offensive against me now do i want to go for criminal uh, defamation or do i want to go for civil defamation god knows what all provisions are there but the basic idea is as a user just because i was not using it and other people were actually misusing it was that the answer for striking 66a down when it comes to privacy issue see the, let's let's make it into two different aspects one is the adequacy of data and when it is called for how it is called for let's not get into that so there is a lot of data which is available because of surveillance and that data is vulnerable and that data can be a personal data that can be data can be a business data whatever and the government has actually set up a lot of surveillance techniques to do that uh, for example your cms is there the netra which they set up last year uh, nedr and netra is there then you have nat grid which is there uh, in fact one of these they, it also allows in fact it, it has it's a mandate that the telecom they have to install certain surveillance equipments there where they will be storing <coughs> a lot of data. Yeah, right. So, That's so, so there's a vulnerability of data. See, see, one, there is there's a reason why you have a surveillance mechanism in place. It obviously needs to be, uh, you know, kind of exercised with a lot of judicial oversight, with a lot of other kind of uh, uh, checks and balances. Because, I'll tell hmm. you what happened, okay? There's no judicial thinking. It's just that there has to be a reason why someone needs my private information. Where is that reason? Is someone informing me about it? Where is the basis that my private information can be accessed? My point is you are doing it at your own risk. You know that there is a surveillance mechanism despite that and people somebody for that. When you say that, you know, where is that you know, said that my private information can be used? Most of us click on I accept on Facebook. I have, <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I when you know. So I did the, so Vodafone is supposed to do that. So my Vodafone, when you sign that particular document, right. if you learn, read Who the, drafted that lawyers drafted it? We are not the lawyers drafted it. The aspect here is less, 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 Feeding a lot of information into right. it, and 20 lakh subscribers using the forums to actually exchange a lot of data. Right. right. So yes, so a lot of data is being exchanged. Right. It can be some of them is personal data, and of course, a lot of it is being circulated. All, all the data which you actually use otherwise is available to everybody to look on. Right. So, so from your perspective, right. wh what do you think, and, and do you also kind of? Uh, store the data for example there's a law that all these cyber cafes they have to have the logs of all the uh, the users at right. least for one year they have to preserve it with them right? right so 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 what are the first of all how do you manage all of this and what are your views on the entire right so uh, as, so basically we are an intermediary here so we uh, a lot of data comes in on onto onto our portals i'll be very honest we have never received any request from any authority asking for any data but but having said that 
there is always this inherent you know um, the uh, inherent thing in our mind that you know one day you know the data that we have right now will, will, will that data will need to share it with somebody uh, one of my concern every time someone actually brings this uh, issue is uh, what happens if i don't have any proof okay what happens just a second give, give, give me a minute here what happens when there is no proof yes i got this uh, that there was this message sent to me or there was this email but i deleted it i i don't think i keep each and every message that is out there i don't think i keep each and every email sometimes i react emotionally and i would just want to delete it and get over with it so in those moments it could be useful so just bringing the other side in those moments it could be useful so is was there any possibility to put any clause there and that what are the scenarios what are the situations where you can actually pull out someone's personal information if your data is required for some investigative purpose now again you have to remember that the data is can be collected or given only on account of the purpose for which it has been uh, you know taken he cannot use that data for you know any other purpose rather than that investigative purpose i am giving you example for a police now for example though again enforcement leaves a lot to be desired all the information which is with facebook all the information which is with other social media providers i do not know how it's being used there's no transparency as you know many a times there's no transparency yeah, so also, can use also, it also i government can use it a very good example is snowden's example the entire you know controversy over nsa snooping over their private citizens that is a huge controversy now if something like that in india happens first of all how are you going to decide or how are you going to make that anybody can make an allegation how are you going to prove it let's not talk about just you know what the government See, the is doing the problem wrong. is not proving james the problem is here that you decided that i should be my phone should be listened to okay and you are getting my data and you have gotten an expert judgment and i don't even know about it so there is no question of you know going to someone going to court and getting no, justice it's, 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 you know it's, it's all about that you know my right Uh, you know i don't even know this is a very picky no, issue you know what people are so, doing my if you want to so, so if you are going how they get that just ramana just to come to it if you look at how privacy law is developed in india it's developed through violation and then possible abuse highlighted in the press yeah. the first uh, privacy safeguards which are uh, constructed with respect to telecommunications were on a petition by pucl on a disclosure yeah. with respect to tapping of politicians uh, phones. phones this is in 1996 yeah. okay and uh, Uh, then the safeguards which are evolved by the court, and there's a discuss discussion also. Should we have judicial scrutiny or just executive function? And in fact, uh, Amakai of the court, Mr. Kapil Sibal, not even a counsel to any party in the court, suggested that a judicial scrutiny would be a very onerous obligation for the state to obtain, even if ex parte. Now that is now Rule 419A, which is now imposed. We see two subsequent notable petitions before the Supreme Court. The first is the Amar Singh one, and the second is the pending uh, Ratan Tata one with respect to again uh, uh, interception, which has been done without proper legal process. In Amar Singh, the uh, tapping order by itself was a forgery, as claimed by the police, and the service provider was scolded for complying with it. The service provider stated, "We get such notices every now and then." The Supreme Court stated, "There is typos. How can you accept it?" And they said, "This is the uh, kind of notices which are." sent by the police because there is no process by itself there is no subsequent disclosure to the person who is uh, who's been put under surveillance and now we come to the justice shah report what is the justice shah report is saying the justice shah report is saying we need to balance the interest of a user against a uh, the government request for national security and whenever interception order is passed after the interception ceases this notice has to be made available to a person who's been put under surveillance so they can approach judicial remedies before a regulator what is the larger issue here the larger issue is our intelligence agencies not created under any statute not having any oversight whatsoever and you know resisting any kind of legal regulation whatsoever the only statute with respect to our intelligence agencies is one which creates penal offences for any of the officers to comment in public which names them by itself okay and if you look at the press itself a comprehensive privacy statute which creates a regulator has been till date prevented for the past 2 years because the intelligence bureau raw ntro uh, have all stated that they do, do not want to come within the ambit of it and let's see who is the principal violator of our privacy even if we take the example of snowden 
it is the state it is not a private entity by itself the private entities data is a very convenient um, uh, 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 catchment area for government agencies to go and this is much more dangerous when we come to internet communications they are much more personal they cut deeper sometimes it's not even with a person my search query logs are much more personal i will never admit to a medical problem even to 90% 99% of my friends i'll even hide uh, if my sexual orientation is not uh, heteronormative to my parents and uh, you know all these fears we go on the internet we voice them there we have anonymous handles yeah this is a deeper cut at privacy and the longer we wait you know this is becoming the norm by itself and it is principally due to the obstinance of the security intelligence agencies by itself you go through the commentary it's quite open it's quite open and this is even a noted in mainstream publications by itself and mass surveillance by itself they had proposed to bring in rule 419b to uh, you know cause amendments to the uasl licenses and to have these mandated uh, kind of like but they they are not even going by legal process by itself it again goes back to the entire aadhar arguments you know uh, you just want to do something so you go ahead with it uh, with a notification and the notification doesn't list out any kind of parliamentary or executive oversight so but it's it's about a well defined regulation without any ambiguity which categorically defines a lot of things which is otherwise missing this, so 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 you know in fact uh, so uh, what so now i would just want you to uh, closing remarks okay so because a long discussion this will go on and on and on for right yeah. so so basically whatever so we, we have 66a we have surveillance we have everything yeah. and uh, so so from you we india largest democracy the essence of democracy is dissent there would be dissenting voices there would be disagreements there would be a uh, lot of data floating around in the open spaces lot of them personal and as uh, apar has just said a you know, lot of them very personal so you think that we are still in a country where the law is evolving we are in a in a country which is uh, the law is again a lot of cultural uh, compulsions are there a lot of religious compulsions are there etc so so you 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 think or you know right just, future not just india globally i think the jurisprudence is still far from you know kind of uh, having reached a conclusion uh, uh, we are we, we have long way to go but there are competing interests we need to acknowledge that so the the deep cut you're talking about absolutely it's a very very significant concern but then at the same time are we are we happy to be living in a world where the state does not have powers to really kind of you know because because the moment there's a there's a attack uh, the taj hotel in bombay the intelligence agencies are the first uh, you know kind of so the, they're the guys we get get after there's a balance we need and uh, what we need and how do we get there with with very well thought out regulation um, and um, in, i mean india of course is kind of uh, Way, way behind, but even in the US, I think they still not figured out where they stand or where they should be standing. Right. So we'll get there eventually, but there will be a lot of pain on the way. Yeah. Absolutely, a lot of pain. So when he speaks about balance, uh, Raman, so he just spoke about the Taj attack. In fact, uh, very recently, because of the surveillance, and especially the social media, a lot of such volunteers were actually going to Iraq to volunteer for the ISIS. Actually, they were caught. Right. So yes, it also has one brighter side to it. So what? What are your your closing remarks? Surveillance on publicly available data. I, I, they, these people are not ISIS. You know, all these fighters from India are not caught based on private communication. Right. And a lot of times it is reported by other users. So we are not like it's not. I haven't heard of like major breakthroughs that. the nsa or like also those are not publicly available right. i haven't heard of like you know miraculous savings of the country uh, heroic things happening out of right. this kind of surveillance besides but i want to make another different point you know i think a major issue with this debate is that it's very uh, urban centric a certain kind of people who uses the internet are part of it and there is a lot of people who are left out of this and the reason that we are being like you know this brings back to the first point we started discussing you know about what is the role of the public and the common people in this uh, in, in, in this whole thing i think it fundamentally comes down to the point of people deciding what this country is all about yes. okay and uh, a lot of uh, we we have to figure out a way you know i do not discount judicial processes and the dialogue that happens within the executive legislature and judiciary but ultimately people decide where they going to live in and this has to be like you know this has to be like it's our duty as educated people and even like you know what uh, he is doing or we are doing we are doing education even you are you are doing cartoons for people he is uh, you know give, giving the lawyers a platform to communicate and and all of you you know in different ways have a big role to play to take it to a different level where people feel a part of this they they feel proud of even a, you know in many countries people who do not use internet feels proud of the liberty 
that you know this, this country stands for liberty it stands for personal freedom individuality right so these things have to somehow we have to bring back the discussion there yes. like that is a that is a real battle that's going to happen like you know you can do it for some time but you know judicial processes are transient today you decide something 10 years later maybe a different but ultimately it's about people and even even parliamentary laws everything is transient Everything's but right. what really holds together the entire thing and you know you, you want to fight against the nsa is not going to happen through your judicial average judicial process and i really believe that people have to that that uh, standard building the consensus that people that this is our country which stands for liberty stands for real equality that has to actually uh, go through and i believe internet will be a big vehicle for that but maybe something beyond is also needed censoring it won't help and right. censoring yeah so <laughs> liberty yeah, again so so just just taking to the other side uh, ramo go to that free speech thing right, so so ramo just said very it's something very interesting and he spoke about how this all being urban centric i just wanted to share a very interesting data in fact as per cis in 2012 december this data was shared that 78% of this country is is connected with the telecom that's the mobile and the maximum number of surveillance which happens in india is is the telecom yes. right so so now going to apart the closing remarks a uh, couple of things very quickly a telegraph act 1885 right so again prehistoric it's come still coming in and what they say is that the government can do the surveillance two two reasons are required a it's it should be an emergency or public security two things and apart from all the other sections which we had earlier discussed what are your views and the way to go ahead especially looking at this enormous uh, surveillance 66a or the net neutrality closing remarks very quickly what do you think okay so i think the proper role of the state is uh, to recognize and to uh, trust its citizens by itself it is not to you know uh, uh, force choices on them if they do not affect uh, and harm or injure others who are there uh, this is the very basis of a democracy where plurality of choice dissent is tolerated and permitted this is not been permitted on media for a large point of time given that media uh, was essentially a, a, you know a, a kind of a asymmetric communication there was a producer of media flowing down and then we were just average consumers the internet has enabled a two way communication it is much more symmetric and it is challenging these bases in power each one of us today has the power of being a television news producer as well as having the power of opening a newspaper one through a channel on a streaming website the other through our own personal blog and we have to protect these liberties when we give access and when we argue on access and spread internet all through we have to do it on these fundamental premises without compromising them and i believe you know uh, a censored internet a walled internet if it is rolled out to people uh, on the basis that yes we have to make compromises for expanding access to the rural interiors of india would not be rolling out the internet itself it would be a propaganda tool again either for a specific segment of industry or the government the internet is a democratizing force the un special rapporteur frank lyon leader rule has said it and we have to go ahead with it we have to go ahead with the judgment of shreya singhal and we have to keep continue engaging in these conversations as voiced by others this is a continuous process there are diverse stakeholders interests and we need to uh, to a certain extent acknowledge participate in it and uh, look towards uh, you know uh, uh, using the internet uh, with a force towards advancing all these interests to whichever extent it's possible it's possible yes uh, transient as raman mentioned statutes then of course the shreya singhal judgment uh, and you spoke about a lot of freedom of law and people interpreting it and then perhaps taking it and the judiciary uh, playing its own role in, in shaping up perhaps the the statutes and the laws to come this time yeah you know just to close on apar's uh, comments i would say that yes we need a regulation however that regulation should be for a, not a purpose of certain people's benefits that's first of all regulatory authority must be very clear cut their powers must be well defined and you know that's how we will ever get to a solution to all these problems whether it be free speech uh, expression you know uh, like you know many a times most of the laws are coming under that famous term who guards the gardens as as simple as that right now that's what is happening you have uh, well intentioned sections obviously every one of us 
uh, us here are patriots. So we'll say, yes, we need to protect our country. That may be an intention behind the surveillance laws. That may, you know, historically, if you see that the Telegraph Act 1885 was brought in to actually combat the revolutionarism of that time's freedom fighters. So, you know, it made it a crime for two people to sit in a room and a third person, Mr. You know, Jack had ever, even even uttered his name there, he would also get into that particular. That particular type of surveillance was for that purpose. Now, getting it into a post-independent country, they needed to have been changes, you know, which would have been much more organized and much more specific. As I said, what we have been doing till now, if you see our IT Act, it's a blind copy of the, uh, you know, uh, UNSICTRAL un code for, you know, right. information technology. Now, what we have done is we have blindly copied, word for word, what the European Union has said to us and, you know, what the other countries have said without even looking at how they have enforced it. America has 13 different laws on privacy itself. 13 different industries, 13 different laws. Specifications, UK has, you know, a much more in-depth analysis of the law and for situations where the Comptroller General can themselves so much take action. Right. India, we took up the unit of uh, model code, put it into Information Technology Act, no particular, you know, uh, safeguards, checks, ambiguities. That's what, you know, so the basic thing what we can see out of the discussion is that the legislation has done this. They will keep on doing it in the future also. There's no denying that. The more effective way people voicing their opinions is very good. But the more effective way is to become judicially proactive. That's one. Secondly, people need to go and fight. You know, fight. Nowhere in the law books or anywhere does it say a PIL has to be filed by a lawyer. Or only a PIL can be only fought by a lawyer. Right. You, I, I can cite many cases in which, you know, they have to, uh, individual people have taken on upon Facebook mm -hmm. and they are fighting the cases in various parts of the country. So the basic thing is, if you want to, just sending an online petition does not help. Right. If you really want to make an effect, if you really want to make a change, do it yourself. Do not wait for somebody else to come up and make the change. So basically is that 66A or that surveillance. If you have a problem, go fight. Go fight. And to fight, you you need to be proactive and aware. In fact, now coming okay, to Canada, knowledge. of course. So, so when you when you say you need to be aware, so yes. uh, law to you you're doing a lot of things with that. So what are your closing remarks? What do you think can be done to make people more aware? As Pallavi also mentioned that time, that had I known or if I know. So, so what really changes when you make people aware of their rights? <coughs> yes, I think in our country we have a long way to go in, in terms of the work that we have to do. And internet plays a very important role in creating a level playing field in terms of making people aware about their rights. And reaching out to people where there is no, you know, other means of communication. A mobile phone can do a fabulous job in get, getting people on board. Um, so I think, you know, it is extremely important that some of the basic laws and basic parts of the, you know, uh, fundamentals behind our constitution must reach everybody and, and uh, if that is done and if people have trust amongst themselves in our society, I think that trust has bound to re be reflected in our institutions and the way government also kind of um, regulates us. If if we use internet uh, responsibility, uh, responsibly and if we also um, have trust in the communication that we have with our, uh, each other, then um, I think... Um, and if you use the systems well in, in terms of uh, how James mentioned that uh, using the institutions to further our rights and enforcing the awareness towards the right direction, um, I think that can really play a fundamental role in terms of bridging the knowledge gap, bridging the gap between the uh, haves and have nots and create a more equal society where I think free flowing of information and liberty will automatically take place. So, so coming to Vivek, if, if there was all free flowing society and a lot of liberty and equality, we will not we would not be having this talk. <laughs> so I think we have it because we there existed 66A which was actually scrapped off. We, we have ambiguity in Inco Information Technology Act and of course we have a gentleman called Vivek Jain who has a has a wonderful portal called LCI where we are actually uh, talking about the LCI talk. Vivek, your views. Last. See, uh, what I strongly believe that uh, you know from, from an internet startup point of view, uh, 
neutrality of the internet is an absolute must. We we cannot uh, think about compromising on it at any level whatsoever. Uh, you know, uh, is there? So now, just to give my example, if I can, you know, if you allow me to give my example, 15 years back when I started this website, GeoCities was one of the website. It was like one of the most trafficked website on the planet, right? Do you remember? Yes. And then you had this uh, for QA, you had Yahoo groups. Uh -huh. I was 17 year old then and I was in remote corner of Northeast. Uh, internet to me seemed like something, you know, which is absolutely neutral, level playing field and I can do whatever I want on, on this platform. If um, if that time that, uh, uh, now, now coming back, you know, fast forward 15 years now, any, uh, uh, you know, 17 year old from a garage is wanting to start an internet startup and he suddenly sees that, you know, the neutrality aspect has been compromised. And uh, you know, uh, uh, corporates from deep, deep pockets with deep pockets and business houses have uh, have created certain walls, which are not allowing him to create a product which is uh, you know e equally competitive with you know uh, 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 with them. I mean, that is something which is the most you know uh, uh, thing that we need to fear about. Um, uh, if you want to kill the internet startup revolution that is happening in this country right now, then we have we th then the neutrality aspect has to be protected. So yeah, so that is something which I. Uh, yeah. As you really just mentioned, the remote corner of northeast. So in Assam, in Assamese, we have a phrase called lahe lahe. That means slowly, slowly. So I believe, of course, lahe lahe, slowly, slowly, the things will change. And and I just remembered a beautiful nazm for a great writer called Faiz Ahmed Faiz, who would write revolutionary stuff. And he wrote something on freedom of speech in 1950s, 52, in fact. Uh, and I believe freedom of speech was very important that time, still very important today. And, and he wrote a nazm which is called Bol. Bol means the freedom of speech. And he said that Bol ki lab azad hai tere, Bol zuba ab tak teri hai. Bol ye sutma jism hai tera, Bol ye ja ab tak teri hai. Bol ye thoda vakt bhoat hai, jismo zuba ke maut se pehle, Bol ye thoda vakt bhoat hai, jo kuch kehna hai wo kehle. Bol ki lab azad hai tere, Bol zuba ab tak teri hai. So I believe, of course, we all have that, that, that freedom of speech with us. We all have that time and we just have to make ourselves count in whatever little time we are given. So thank you so much for all the wonderful people who actually came here and what an insightful discussions we have had here. In fact, all uh, dignitaries, I would call, uh, the luminaries of their own fields and professions, uh, whether it's legal, whether it's, it's startups or, or the social crusaders who are all over here. So I think thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, a special, special mention to, of course, Praveen. And thank you so much hey, for giving us this opportunity and for LCI Talk. What a wonderful initiative. Thank you so much. A big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.